Y'all, y'all ready for the word? All right. Wade, you're going to have to start putting that song at the beginning of the rotation stood at the end. That kind of <clears throat> messes up my voice a little bit before I get up here. What a song, huh? You know, when I was young, and I remember going to some baptisms down there in the, in the church singing, singing that together. And uh, it didn't mean as much to me as it does, I think, today. Start thinking about those that are there waiting on us. Y'all ever think about those that are there waiting on us? I do. <laughs> more and more. Can't wait to walk through. We can't wait to to get home. This is not our home, right? We're just we're just passing through. Well, here we are back in Acts chapter twenty two. We're moving along. Paul, as we learned last week, has been taken a prisoner. He's actually saved his life from the Jews, but Paul's a prisoner at this point, and he will remain a prisoner until his death. Paul's always going to remain under the control of Roman authorities. But he doesn't care. That's what I picked up on this week, and really looking back at this again for the umpteenth time, you know. But I, I, just, I just kept thinking, Paul just doesn't really care that he's, in, that he's in prison, that he's under guard. He just keeps telling people about Jesus. And it hit me, as I've said to you recently, and if they start censoring us uh, Christians in this world we live in, they want to silence you. They don't want to hear your hate, your judgment, your condemnation. Those are the words you'll hear, you know, from people. You Christians are just haters, You're just judging everybody. And they just fail to realize all, that it's not my judgment you should be concerned about. You're under an eternal condemnation of a God Almighty who created everything. That should make you very concerned. I'm the least of your concerns. All I am is air going over vocal cords, right, that's, that's telling you what God said. You need to take it up with Him. That's what we're seeing Paul does here. Paul's like, hey, everything that I'm doing, God is doing through me. So take it up with Him. I'm nothing. I'm nothing but a vessel that the Lord God Almighty is using to make the world know who He is. That's it. I cannot boast of anything. The only thing I'm really good at is being a sinner. And I got really good at it, just like all of you did. I boast in Him, in Him alone, my Lord. He was perfect. He carried my sin to the cross, and He knew no sin. But Paul doesn't care if he's a prisoner. He just keeps telling people about Jesus. And I got to thinking, if they put me down here in the county jail because I refuse to preach this hate speech, they're going to call it, you know what? I'm going to miss you guys. I'm going to miss my family. It's really going to be difficult not to lay down beside my wife at night, right? And curl up with her. And I have to lay on that old concrete pad down there. And it's cold. The guys say it's cold. And we go down there and talk to them. They're like, man, it's just cold all the time. And they say, nobody sleeps at night. They sleep during the day. So I guess I'd have to adjust my sleep. But you know what? I'm gonna, I think that all I'm going to be doing is telling them about Jesus. So whether I'm here or whether I'm there, I'm learning from the Apostle Paul Just tell them about Jesus. I talked to a guy this week. He said, man, I feel like I missed my calling. I think I was supposed to be a preacher. I'm like, well, you didn't miss nothing. You don't have to be in the pulpit at a local church to be a preacher. Just go preach. Just preach. Everybody you talk to, teach them about Jesus. Preach to them. You don't have to be here. Most of you are going to find out in the next several years, some of you already know this, you're not really learning so much from me. Some of you are, because you're not really doing any study and you're not listening to any sermons. So you're really only learning from me. But most of you, as you begin to get into the Word, you find out that you learn far more about the Bible in your own personal study at home than you ever do from a pulpit. Because, real, let's just be honest, there's only so much you can retain of what I say today. Right? That's why I tell you, I tell you twice. Just trying to help you, you know, to get it along. But we can't, we're just human. Some of you right now, your mind's, oh boy, I'm starting to think, you're thinking about lunch. A variety of things that we start getting distracted by. And we have to sit there, don't we, Jimmy? Yeah, he's laughing because he knows we get distracted. I know, I've sat in there in chairs longer than I've stood up here. And I know how my mind would get distracted. So what you have to do is you have to, you have to start off like today. Say, okay, now where are we? You know, Paul went into Jerusalem. You know, he come back, he's been gone 20 years, and he wanted to bring that money to those poor Jewish Christians there in Jerusalem. And they made him go and do a Nazarite vow. He had to go in there and shave his hair off, you know, and do all this stuff. He didn't have to do that. He doesn't have to. He's not 
He's not a Jew anymore. He's a Christian now. He doesn't have to, but he does it because the elders told him to do it. And he's trying to show these Jewish people that I'm not against you. I'm with you. I was one of you. I understand everything that you do. I was a Pharisee of Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, right? He's telling them all of this stuff. He said, but let me tell you about Jesus. This is what you guys are missing. So that's where we're at. And you have to kind of be intentional about saying, all right, so Paul has moved from Judaism. He's moved from being stuck to the law to now he's preaching grace. That salvation is only by grace. It's the gift of God. It's not by being good. You can't come to heaven by being a good person or by stop doing bad things. It's only by believing in, uh, in Christ, having faith in Christ. And that is the gift of God. And so Paul keeps preaching this, keeps preaching this. He doesn't care if he's in prison or if he's in a synagogue. It doesn't matter. He's just going to keep telling them who Jesus is. All that matters to Paul at this moment while they've got him in chains is that he belongs to the Lord. That's the greatest confidence that you could ever have. You belong to the Lord. And he knows that the Lord is in absolute control of all things. But he needs to go now in his mind. And this is your mindset. I just need to go where the Spirit leads. And where the Spirit speaks, I listen. And I do what the Spirit leads me to do. He's looking for opportunities to tell people about who Jesus is. I told you last week and several times before, Scott Horde is going to come to our church here on March the 7th and he's going to preach for us. He's going to tell you all about his ministry. And I hope you guys will spread the word around our community. You know, have people come because this is a ministry that needs to be supported. This is a real deal guy that is out there on the streets Monday through Friday preaching the gospel trying to rescue these babies. And we need to stand behind him, I think. And uh, we'll be presenting more to you about that. But this guy's coming and he told me, he said, Derek, tell your people, Whenever you meet somebody and they got and you and you they got a cross around their neck or a tattoo on their arm, whatever it is, you see a cross, you ask them, what does the cross mean to you? That's how you can be intentional about beginning gospel conversations. Now let me go ahead and tell you what's going to happen. Probably more than 50% of them that that have that cross on are not born again Christians. That's my experience. They're going to say all kinds of things to you. And that's that that's okay, because now you get to say, now, hey, I understand that's what you think of Jesus, but let me, if you got a few minutes, let me tell you why Jesus had to go to the cross. And let me tell you what the Bible says, right? So you get to share the real Jesus with them. And you may get to see someone become born again. Some people are out there, and they're not hating God. They love God. They love Jesus. But they're misinformed on who God and who Jesus is. And that's where we come along. And that's the same thing that Paul's doing. See, these Jews are saying they love God, but they're fixing to kill this guy. See the, hip, see the hypocrisy here? They don't know who God is. If Je it's just like Jesus said, if you knew God, you wouldn't be doing this to me. But you don't know God. He said, you're of your father the devil, and you will only do what your father does, right? And uh, Anyway, we, we need to see these things. Romans 14 is a very famous verse. He'll put it up on the screen for you. Y'all listen to this one. This is what is in the mindset of Paul as he's going, as he's in chains right now, and he's looking for this opportunity to win his brothers and sisters, right? Remember I told you a couple of weeks ago, he said, I would wish myself accursed to see my brothers saved. That's how much he's showing you guys that he loves these people. He's not against Jerusalem, uh, the Jews. He, is, he loves them and he wants to see them saved. But he knows as he's going through this persecution, as he's getting put in prison, as people are rejecting him, this is what is on his mind. For none of us lives for himself. Can you honestly say that today? Look at that. None of us lives for himself. And no one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I don't live anymore, but Christ liveth in me. So you got to let go. Look, I'm not here for me. I don't want to waste my time just scrolling, waiting to die. I live for the Lord. Lord, what would you have me do? This is what's on Paul's mind. We have to remember this is not our home. We're just passing through. And listen to this, church. I, this, this came to my mind the other day, and I thought it was very good. 
we find ourselves fearing losing treasures and comforts and freedoms, do we not? We're just human. Let's just be honest. We fear losing treasures, comforts, and freedoms. But we might have forgotten the treasures, comforts, and freedoms that are to come. That's what we should be focused on. And I promise you the treasures and comforts and freedoms that the Lord God Almighty has for us in heaven far outweighs any little thing you can go to Walmart and buy. But Paul is pleading with Jews to listen to him. There's a lesson we're getting. We're pleading with people, listen to me. I told a man, you know, he's concerned about his father-in-law. And I said, let me tell you what I'd do. With tears in my eyes, I would get his undivided attention. And I'd say, Pop, listen to me. This is important to me that you understand. Now, you can't save him. You can't make him believe. But you know what you can do? You can plead with him to listen to you share the gospel. Will you give me your undivided attention for just a few minutes and let me tell you, and let him see the sincerity in your face. Let him understand how important this is to you. And he's like, yeah, yeah. I said, I'll go with you. If you want me to sit there with you, I'll go with you. But I think it might be better just you and him one-on-one. -on -one. I really do. You love him so much. He's like a father to you. Just go to him. If tears come to your eyes, that's okay. That's okay. Tears come from love, don't they? You know? Tears come from love. Show him how much you love him. This is what Paul's doing. He's pleading with these Jews to listen to him. He said the Messiah came and you killed him. He's been explaining that he was just like them. In fact, he was even more than them. He was going after Christians to persecute them and to imprison them. He stood there, he told them, while they stoned Stephen to death. He stood there and watched them kill that sweet man, Stephen. And all he did was want to tell people about Jesus. That's all Stephen did. He had a heart for Christ. He just wanted to tell them. And they took up big rocks and they pounded him to death with them for telling people about Jesus. And Paul said, I was there and I watched it. I was just like you guys. But let me tell you what the Lord Jesus did. He knocked me flat on my face and blinded me and he showed me who he really is. And now I'm here to tell you and show you the whole truth. And the truth is, Today, you sitting in this room, you listening out there in, in your pajama land, and all everybody else, whatever, you listen to this truth. You must repent and commit your life to following Christ. Like that, didn't you, Ronnie? We got her pajama land. They're listening to him, though, until, and here we are today, they're listening to this big speech. And in verse 21, this is where it shuts them down. Now watch this, verse 21. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And that ended it. That ended their listening to him right there. One word, Gentiles. No way are they going to listen to some man tell us that the Gentiles can get the same salvation that we get. Not us. We're the children of Abraham. We are not like them wicked Gentiles who flush babies down their drains. That's what they did back then, you know. I saw this woman yesterday in a Facebook thread talking about she can't wait to get another abortion. She did this little picture of her squishing it, you know, and blood, kept, you know, just excited about it. You know, this is, how, this is how they see these people. Now, see, we can see somebody post something like that on Facebook, can't we? And what does it do? It makes us angry, right? Until we remember the Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 4 that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. I'm not mad at that girl. You know who I'm mad at? I'm mad at the enemy that controls her. And you know what I'm doing? I've been praying all night. God, send your Holy Spirit in there and break her heart wide open. Remove her from, this, from the sin of lesbianism and homosexuality and from the sin of abortion. Forgive her, Father. What did Jesus cry from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What did Stephen say when they were stoning him? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Church, this is our heart. Paul has given us an example here. He could have very well just bailed out of Jerusalem, right? He could say, look, I'm a Roman citizen. Let me go. We're fixing to find out. But, but let's see what Paul does. Look at verse 22. They listened to him up to this statement. And then they raised their voices and said, when he said, Jesus told me that you, I'm sending you to the Gentiles so that they get the same salvation that you Jews are getting, they listened to him, and when they heard that, they said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. That means, kill him. We do not want him to live. 
That's what that meant. For he should not be allowed to live. All right, they made it clear. This is the key in the gospel presentation, right? Obviously, the very first words there. Acts 22, 22. What's the first words? They listened to him. Church, you have got to get people to listen to you. That's difficult sometimes. I get it. But that's your goal. Maybe you can't get them. Maybe you're at the grocery store checkout line, right? And there's people in line. That's probably not the best time to get into the gospel conversation. That's a good time to plant a seed. Hey, haven't seen you at church. You know, hey, do you know where my, whatever, you know, you can plant seeds. But at some point, you've got to get them to listen to you, look them in the face, and explain to them the gospel. Don't just keep throwing out little comments and walking away. You have got to have the talk, every one of us, at some point. You've got to find the time and do it. Well, they heard Gentiles getting saved. Immediately, Paul, we've got to kill him. <laughs> now, when they heard of the group Gentiles, it made me think, I want to present to the church, is there any people or a group of people that you don't want to be saved? Think about that in your own heart. Is there someone who's hurt you so bad or upset you so much or a people that you don't like because of what they do that you don't want them saved? Nobody, right? I hope not. If it is, you better hit your knees this afternoon and ask God to remove that, that hate from you and, and restore the love that He has given you. They didn't just walk away and ignore Him like you're going to see today. Some people, you're talking Jesus. Well, here comes Derek. Oh, Lord. You know. They walk away. I see it. They, didn't, they don't want to just ignore pretty soon, just like with Paul then. They wanted him dead. And pretty soon, they're going to want me dead. And they're going to want you dead. They want to silence you, church. Make no mistake about it. And one of the questions I've been thinking about posing on the Facebook here, I'm trying to curious how, how I should pose it. Is some of you who, who seem to hate the church and hate all these Christians that's judging everybody and all this stuff, I want to ask them, are you going to stand there while they kill us? How are you going to be? I mean, somebody I grew up with my whole life, they don't agree with me on my Christianity at all, but they like me. We're childhood friends. Are you going to stand there and, watch, and let them kill me? Are you going to stand there and watch that? How far will you go? You know, that's something that I'm, maybe some of y'all who post things better will answer that for me. Look at verse 23. It says, As they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air. Can you just see this scene? This scene? So <laughs> it's, it's funny, really. They're throwing off their cloaks and they're grabbing up dirt to throw at him. You know, they can't stone him because remember the Roman soldiers have got him and he's up there in Fort Antonio now. So that's a, that's a long ways. It'd be like me trying to hit Josh with a rock from here, you know. I mean, I used to be pretty good back in the day, but I think my shoulder would be gone after one throw. But so they just start grabbing dust and they're throwing their cloaks off. It's this big old dramatic scene that they're going through. But this has been passed down to them. This is what they did when they heard blasphemy, right? You remember the word blasphemy? You know, that's to give others, really, let me put it to you simply, to give other people a misrepresentation of who God is, right? To give a false view of His glory and His holiness and His authority and His character to misrepresent God. Blasphemy. Well, we can be just like these Jews here. We can. Put yourself in their shoes. Some, look at Romans 2. Look on the screen. This is a very important passage I wanted to put in here this week. Y'all pay attention here if you drifted. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know His will and approve the things that are essential. Alright? So put yourself there. You know His will. You approve the things that are essential. Being instructed out of the law. You've been taught the scripture and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. Yep, I know how to tell them right, Derek. I know how to tell them right from wrong. A light. Remember Jesus said, you're a light on the hill, right? Don't put your light under a bushel. You're a light to those who are in darkness. Yes, I get it. A corrector of the foolish. Oh boy, I'm good at that one. I can correct the foolish all day long. A teacher of the immature. Yep, many of us here, you know, how, you know what I'm talking about. Having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. You, therefore, who teach another. Here it comes, church, right back at you. Remember when I point a finger, how many's pointing back, right? 
You. Uh, here, I lost my place. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? Here it is, pay attention. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Just as it is written. And he goes back to Isaiah. Does the community get a misrepresentation of who Jesus is by watching you? You blaspheme the name of God. Nathan told that to David, didn't he? You blaspheme the name of God, David, by the way you live. You think you can run out here and do this with Bathsheba and get away with it? <coughs> you can't. When you say you are a Christian, listen to me on this. People are watching you. Some are watching because they want to know it's real. They want to believe the victories in Jesus. And some are wait, watching you, waiting for you to fail so they can say, I knew it. I knew it wasn't real. But they're watching you either way. The Jews here were taught to stone to death someone who cursed God. Someone, that's really what blasphemy is, right? To curse God. And so they were taught in Leviticus 24, 16, this is what they were taught. This is why they're doing what they're doing. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. Right? All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. So they're saying, Paul, by you going to the Gentiles, by Jesus saying that to you, whatever, that is blasphemy. Because there's no way that God's going to let those Gentiles hoard in on our salvation. And who's right? Who's wrong? See, some of y'all that don't like that whole right and wrong thing, you're like, well, just I'm just not that. No, they're wrong. And tell them they're wrong. For God so loved the who? The world. He's going to save a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. From all over the world. God is not a respecter of persons. That's our message. Our message is to go to the any nationality to any sinner and say, look, dude, I really don't care what sin you committed. I mean, whoo, that was a good one, you know. But I really don't care because guess what? God forgives sin. All sin. That's what He does. That's why Jesus said He came into the world. He said, I didn't come into the world to condemn. I came to the world to what? So that the world might be saved. Now He's coming back and He's going to condemn all those who don't believe, right? He's going to... He's going to slaughter them now. But this little scene here of them throwing off their robes and tossing dust in the air, they've learned it. They've done it. And they have been doing it for centuries. It, it, it's supposed to be a sign of real grief and sorrow over a broken heart, right? Oh, this person is a false prophet. They're misrepresenting God. And my heart is so grieved and broken over that. But their hearts were not grieved over that. Listen, they missed what their prophet Joel, listen to this, Joel 2.13. Here's what's wrong with these Jews, these Pharisees. Joel 2.13, God said, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Get that? See, they're rending their garments. It's all a, let me show you, or it's all an outward thing. But God is always dealing with what? The heart. They're not rending their hearts. They're renting their garments. He says, return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. They're not being slow to anger, are they? Abounding in steadfast love. They're surely not showing Paul, right, patience and love and slow to anger. And he rel relents over disaster. They want this stuff. They use this dramatic action, though, to stir up other people. They need to get this mob worked up, right, in order to carry out this horrific act. You get a couple of guys, there's Paul, and he's bringing them down here, and he's defiling the temple, and he's speaking against Moses and the law, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, let's go get him. See how they do? They just work them up into a, into a fury. And next thing you know, they've got this mob, this crowd, and they don't even know what they're doing. But for sure, we see that these Jewish people do not have the right heart. They don't want the Gentiles coming in. They don't want to see people that are lost saved they'd have lost their love like scott told you on uh, wednesday night you know if you if you haven't listened go back and listen to the revelation series 
Don't neglect that, church. Every one of you. If you don't know how to do it, if you don't doing the Facebook or whatever, get with us. You know, we'll show you some way that you can watch it. But Scott's talking about the church at Ephesus, at Ephesus and Jesus wrote on that letter, and he said, you've lost your first love. That can creep into this church, I'm telling you. Every one of you can get in the habit of coming down here and listening to me talk for an hour, and then you go home and you never even do anything with it. That's an example of losing your love. The love that Christ has shed abroad in your heart is going to want to go reach lost people and bring them in, every one of us. Because we care. Because He's put His love in our hearts. And even if they're going to kill us, even if they're going to persecute us, even if they're going to put us in jail, guess what? I don't care because I don't live anymore. It's Christ lives in me and I just want them to know about Jesus. If you need to put me in jail, go ahead and put me in jail. But I'm going to keep talking in there. Y'all have to put a gag over me. And don't y'all be coming down taking pictures when, you know, when they put this gag over me. I know some of you are like, oh, I'd like to see that just once. And then you're like, Move on. But I'm going to be talking about Jesus. Look at verse 24. So, the commander now is going to step in. He's got a problem. These Jews are going nuts. He's taking Paul in custody. But here's what he says. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks. Bring him, bring him back up here to the fort. Get him away from the crowd. Stating that he should be examined. Now watch this, church. He doesn't say we should have a trial. We need to bring him up here and question this man. See what's going on. He says we should examine him by scourging. That means the flagellum, the thing that Jesus got. That's that thing with the, the big stick that's got the leather straps, it's got the pieces of glass and metal, whatever, attached to it, so that when they hit your back, it rips your back open. He says we're going to examine him by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. Now, here's the one. <laughs> I like this. The commander, the Chirli Arcos. Remember, the guy who's over a 1,000 people. He's supposedly in control here, but what does he tell us? He has no idea what's going on. And you're the one in control of a thousand men and you don't know what's going on. And, that, and guess what? You've been sitting there listening to Paul tell this story. He's been sitting there describing why he's here and what's going on. But the reality is, is he didn't want to listen. There may be some of you today, I don't know, some of you listening, you hear all of this stuff, but you're not listening. In fact, some may not even care to listen. Just get me out of here. I don't understand it all. I've heard that one a bunch. Well, I don't understand it all, so therefore you're just going to go to sleep and turn it off and forget about it. You know, if, I told, if you knew right now, I've, met, I've used this many times over the years, if you knew right now that outside of these doors, your life will never be the same, that there's been some kind of martial law declared and they're going to round up Christians and be done with us. You'd be listening to what I'm saying. But because the Lord God has allowed you these great comforts in life. Young people, listen to me. you got these great comforts in life. we got all this peace and freedom and all the things that we have. But you know, that didn't come easy. That come with a great, cross, a great price. We've sat here and watched the United States of America be turned over, haven't we? Jason just brought something to my attention this morning I thought was very good about how he saw a, a billboard sign with the, with the military up there and it said, one nation under what? What does it normally say? One nation under, but not now. What does it say? One nation under our watch. You see how they can slowly start putting things in there? It reminds me of the Truth Project years ago. The old man stood up, you know, he said, it's, in a, it's a class. He was going around the churches they were using to help people. He said, in my generation, if I wrote down 911 on a chalkboard, he said, in my generation, he's an older man, we just said that's 911. Now, past a certain, let's say the 70s, whenever the emergency you know, systems started using 911, now when you ask people, what does that number mean to you? Everybody would say, well, it's an emergency number, 911. That's what you dial when you're in trouble. Now, post-2001, when you put 911 up on the board, what do people say? That's September 11th. You see just in a few short years how that changed? So when they start putting billboards up, it says, One Nation Under Our Watch. You see what they can do quickly? They've removed God. And that was a good observation from my brother. I, I never even saw it when he showed it to me. I didn't even get it until I'm like, Oh, now I see it. See, this is the subliminal things that happen and we have to be on guard about. 
Now, Paul, back to this beating, they're going to try to figure out what Paul is doing, what's going on here, and they're going to beat him, right? Now, Paul has been through the lashes. He's been beaten with the rods and with the lashes, but he's not, has, has not been beaten with the flagellum yet. This is a big deal. This is the one they did on Jesus. So, all he ever got was, uh, well, he got a lot. He says, you know, three times he, he received the lashes up to like 40 licks or 39 licks or something. You know, I mean, it was awful what they put him through. But that's the way that this guy's going to get to the bottom of it. Let's just beat him. Matthew 27, 54. Look at this verse. Now, the reason I put this verse in here is I want you to understand something. That even though some people in this scene are not listening, this Shirley Arcos, this guy has not been listening. And you're facing people today that are not listening. You already know that. But there's some that are listening. And this is a reminder. Look at Matthew 27, 54. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said, truly, this was the Son of God. They, he sat there and watched the Lord Jesus die on that cross in that whole horrific scene. And then he saw the earthquake and all the darkness and all the stuff happen. And he was listening. He was paying attention. Not everybody was, but that guy said, truly, this was the Son of God. Paul knows in this scene that he's in, and we're, he's teaching us, no matter where you go or what you're doing, you're carrying Christ there. And somebody's listening. I promise you. It may be the person that's over here that's, that's not really engaging you, but they're listening. They're paying attention. And you're planting a seed, if you will plant the seed, right? And somebody will water it. Look at the next verse, 25. But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said that to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Here we go. Paul is fixing to really get it. They stretched him out with thongs. That's where they put these bracelets around his wrist and wrapped them around a pole and locked him up. And now his back is exposed. And they're fixing to take this whip and they're fixing to rip, hit his back so many times until it just pulls all the flesh off of it. Hoping that he's going to tell them a different story, right? That's what this commander's thinking. I'll get to the truth of it. Now, you beat him enough, he'll tell me the truth. What he don't realize is that's all Paul's going to give him is the truth. He's just going to have to keep beating because Paul ain't going to change his story. But, Paul says, I like this, is this lawful? <laughs> Remember he said, be wise? Church, be wise. Paul's showing wisdom right here. Paul says, is this lawful? What does he mean by that? He means it's a crime to scourge a Roman citizen. You couldn't do that. And Paul lets it be known right here. I am a Roman citizen. Not only that, not only are you about to scourge a Roman citizen, which is unlawful. If you really like history, you go look up the Valerian Law and Portius Law and all that stuff. I didn't decide to bring all that to you today. Y'all can go look up that if you're... If you're curious, after church, maybe I'll remember the name. I don't know. But uh, ask some other history buffs. You'll find out why this became law. But the, but the point I want you to see here is you, you could not scourge, right, a Roman citizen. And you for sure couldn't scourge or beat anyone if there hasn't been a trial. So Paul says, I haven't even been tried. You're violating your own rules. So here we see the Jewish people are out of control, right? Completely out of control. Mob crowd. Not only that, but the Roman leaders are out of control. Isn't God amazing? Y'all see that? God's amazing. I, I pulled this out of here. He's working all of this out. Why? To show you who really is in control. God made Paul a Roman citizen from birth. Look at the next verse. When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. And I always think of, rut row shaggy, you know. We just messed up big time. He goes to his boss and says, we've got a problem. Paul had already surprised this Roman leader before. If you remember back a few weeks back, when, he's, when the commander looked at him and he said, you speak Greek? See, this commander's only thinking this is just some little... Poor, wretched Jew. I mean, imagine, I remember Paul's beat up a little bit. The Jew's been dragging him through the temple courtyard there, beating on him. So 
So he's bloodied up and beaten up, and all he sees is, oh man, it's another one of these nasty Jews. He's beat up. Look, just beat him and send him on his way. That's what he's, that's what he's thinking. Now all of a sudden, his, his centurion's coming back, and he's saying, we got a big problem. This guy is a Roman citizen, and this is a big deal. Now, the commander has got a decision to make. If I get caught, if I carry this out, they're going to remove me from my position and they may even kill me. If I let him go, the Jews are going to riot, right? They're going to have a, there's a mob of them out there, thousands and thousands of them. So he's stuck. Let's see what he does. Verse 27, what would you do? Put yourself in the commander's shoes. What would you do? So the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. The commander answered I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, but I was actually born a citizen. I love God. I love God so much. Y'all, if you don't really study the Bible, I'm telling you, miss out the, how cool God is, if I can say that. I hope that's not wrong. But I think he's cool. I think this is the greatest thing ever. God had already worked this in his plan before he ever created the earth. That Paul was going to be born as a Roman citizen just for this day right here, God had already worked it out that now they can't beat him. Remember what he told him back, back up there in Philippi earlier? You know, he went through a major beating up there. He could have told the Philippian jailer, hey, I'm a Roman citizen, but Paul didn't. You know why Paul didn't tell him he's a Roman citizen there? Because he's got a new little church group with Lydia and them that's just starting up. And by taking the beating that he didn't have to take, when he told them, you've just beat a Roman citizen. Those, those soldiers, those men were like, Paul, oh, please don't tell on us. Please don't tell on us. Just leave. Just leave. We won't bother you no more. So see, I told you back then when we studied that, that Paul has, has protected that little church. Because now they're going to be able to get together and the Philippian jailer will come and join them and the, and the rest of them are not going to bother them, right? So Paul took one for the team. See there? But right here, he decides to go ahead and claim his citizenship. What's, who's going to learn anything if he just takes the beating? It's just the Jews. You know, so Paul, this is discernment. This is wisdom. This is the sovereignty of God working here, okay? Paul is take, uh, God has already taken care of this from the beginning of time. This man says, and I can just see him standing there like, I can't believe this is happening. I mean, I'm just here guarding around this fort here. And now I've got this big problem. And then he hears this Jew, this Greek, you know, is saying, you were born a citizen? And he's thinking, man, I had to buy mine. <laughs> it took me everything I got to get this. And you're a natural born citizen? So what he's saying here really is Paul is a first class citizen. So not only am I about to beat and scourge a Roman citizen, but I'm about to beat a natural born Roman citizen. See, that's a big deal. And I'm just a second-class citizen. I love God. I love how he just, he just painted all this out there. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I want you to understand, this is a very important verse. No temptation is overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Now, but, with the temp, but with the temptation, listen church, will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Paul writes later. See, Paul got to see how God was able to provide him an escape. Paul was not afraid to take the beating. Paul would have taken that beating. He's already taken many beatings. And he's fixing to endure much more hardship. That ain't the issue here, right? What the issue is that God is protected. God is showing that I'm in control. This mob crowd of Jews is not in control. Even the Roman Surely Arcosa, commander of a thousand men, is not in control. Our God is in control. And that's what Paul wants us to see here. And look at verse 29. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him. I like that. These men are sitting there ready to whip him good. I mean, they love it. They love beating these old Jews or beating whoever. But now, look what God does. Immediately, they let go of him. Paul's seen prison doors break open, hadn't he? Remember that miracle? He's seen the chains fall off. And here, he sees good, he sees God at work again. Paul's also seen evil men changed just like that. 
That Philippian jailer. I love that Philippian jailer. We're going to meet him in heaven. He didn't care about Paul being in there in those stocks, remember? He was stretched out as far as you could stretch a man in that filth. He was beaten. He could have got diseased and sick. Just let, wait. He expected to come back the next morning and Paul be dead. But what happened? Instead of Paul dying, the Philippian jailer died that day. He died to self. He died to the things of this world and he turned to Christ. And, he, and we're going to meet him in heaven. So Paul has seen the chains fall off. He's seen the prison doors break. He's seen evil men changed instant, instantly. And right here, he sees these soldiers immediately let go. And then he sees them, they just stand there. It says, and the commander also was afraid. They're all standing there, and the word is uh, afraid, phobio. You know where we get the word phobia from, right? They're standing there, not in, I mean, these are grown men, soldiers, and they are afraid. What is about to happen? But Paul, I can just see him. You know, way I was thinking, I wonder if Paul kind of had a little grin on his face. I think he did. I think he's standing there like, boy, y'all watch this. Watch what God's doing. I wish y'all could see all that God's doing because Paul could see it. Paul knows who's in control. And you know what? Maybe that's why he served him, right? You ever think about maybe why you don't serve him? Maybe you don't truly trust that he's in control of all things. Because I'm telling you, when you really trust God, you ain't worried about much, right? Because he's in control of all things. What have you got to fear? That's why Jesus kept saying so many times, don't fear, don't fear. Why would you fear? That's why Paul says, as I've said twice today, that I don't live anymore, but Christ lives in me. I know who's in control of this scene. And look at verse 30 in closing. But on the next day, <laughs> wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priest and all the council to assemble. And he brought Paul down and set him before them now the man standing there commander of a thousand men and he's afraid and he's confused and he don't know what to do in fact he has to sit there and think about it all night he don't let paul go i mean the men let go of paul but he's just standing there and they wait till the next day it says here to release him and then he decides okay we better get things in order Let's have a trial. So let me go bring the Sanhedrin in. We're going to go back through this again, right? Let's go get the chief priest and all the council. That's the Sanhedrin. That's the 70 ruling members of Israel. Okay, we've talked about this before. And he's going to bring them in, and he's going to set Paul down before them. And he's going to let them explain why it is you think this man needs to be killed. He wants to hear. So he's... He's kind of going in the right direction, right? Let's, let's make this at least look official. Let's bring the, the judges in, and we'll see what happens. And that's what we're going to study next week. We're going to see Paul get to go before the Sanhedrin, just like Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin. Um, and I love this, by the way. I can't wait to see how God embarrasses. You're the teachers of Israel, right? You're the wise one, and God's fixing to embarrass them right they think they're in control and all through this we learn that god is in control god's going to take paul and he's going to put him up on center stage again and in closing i wanted y'all to get from this now we're looking at the apostle paul a great story and he says be imitators of me so what are we supposed to learn here Derek? i mean we're not dealing with romans we're not dealing with jews really but here's what we are doing here's how this applies to you God is putting you in people's faces every single day. Maybe it's a screen nowadays, right? But He is putting you in interaction with people every single day. Just like He put Paul in positions to preach the gospel. And our question that we have to examine ourselves with is are we a witness of who Jesus is? Pure and simple. Do you spend more time talking about hobbies and things of this life that God's going to burn up and will be no more? Or do you spend time talking with people about what's most important? And that is what? Who is Jesus? All right, will y'all stand with me?
You know, when we started off this sermon, I knew, I said, well, you know, it's just going to kind of seem, it's just one of those sermons, just going through the motions kind of, but I'm hoping that I pulled out today if you, that there's an encouragement, a reminder of who is in control of all things. I've seen that last week, I've seen it this week. And you know, I think we need it, don't y'all? Don't you think you need the encouragement that God is in control? If we just do what He says do, things work out a lot better for us. So when we pray right now, I want the church collectively together, all of us, to pray that, that we would not be afraid or ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That every one of us would be more bold into going to people that we know that need to hear the gospel. Alright? That's what I want us to pray. Now, don't just sit there. I want you to pray this. I want you to pray seriously, God, help me make disciples. I'm not good at it. Maybe you've never done it. I really want you to go to the Lord today as we pray and pray that God would give you opportunities. If you're scared to death to do it, I've told you a hundred times, call me. I'll help you. Look around beside you. There's somebody in here, if you can't get me, there's somebody here that'll go with you. But do not keep putting that aside. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we should be praying to you all day. Lord, if we really stopped right now and examined who we are and who you are, I, I feel like a proper response is the church should be on their knees praying until midnight in thanksgiving of all that you've done in prayers of asking for forgiveness of what we've not done, where we have failed you. Lord, in praying that there are so many people that we know that are lost, and that we're fervently praying that you would draw them to you and save them. Lord, I'm afraid the church, and especially the church in America, has gotten too comfortable. We enjoy our comforts and our, our treasures in this life. We don't want to be bothered with the work of the gospel. Lord, I pray that if there's any here that's that way, I, that you'd convict their heart today. They would turn from that way of thinking and start finding out how they can serve you. And Lord, I pray every week, and I pray now, if there's one person in this building, they don't know that they're saved. I pray that they would come and talk to me about that. Let today be the day of their salvation. Father, don't let them put it off anymore. Whatever it is that you're convicting their hearts with today, Father, I pray that they would just take care of those things. Leave them here at the altar. Father, you have blessed us so much. We hope that we're pleasing to you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.